that's where I'm at my happiest, surrounded by great musicians playing a sympathetic part or a sympathetic sound uh, that adds to the whole rather than it's me. Hi everyone and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players. I'm your host David Holloway and I'm thrilled as always to be here with you. Paul, how are you? Good, sir. I'm excited. I'm happy to be back, David. And I just realised I didn't, you know, treat you appropriately with your full name, Paul Bindig. I apologise. I was being too over familiar and non-respectful there. I apologise. Yeah, and not only that, mate, you, you normally come up with some, you normally bury your head in the thesaurus and come up with some strange adjective to describe yes. me. So I was a bit disappointed, mate. Can you just try a bit harder? Is yeah, it because sorry. I've been away? Are you, are you sending me a message? Are you upset with yeah, me? Yeah, I'm sending you a message. No, you know what it is. It's bloody late. <laughs> That's what it is. So, <laughs> it is. And the, the reason it's late is, and it's for all the right reasons, we've just had a brilliant chat with Mr. Jim Sheridan. So as you'll hear, Jim has had an amazing career uh, in Irish TV um, as a touring musician, as a composer. Uh, he also does pretty much everything else not nailed down with with TV and TV production. Mm. Um, and a lot of you, include, and I include myself in this, Paul, I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure you do too, as one of those players that was somewhat self-taught in the early days. Because, Paul, you, did you ever do formal lessons? I did. I, I, like a lot of people who maybe play on the keyboards, I did classical piano lessons as a, yeah. as a young person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but uh, that, yeah, that okay. I, I, I sadly only did about six weeks of organ lessons, and that was about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I find Jim's story quite inspirational, as I'm sure a lot of you out there that maybe haven't had had uh, many lessons will. So yeah, I think I think there's a lot to learn from Jim, and um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it a lot. And we'll talk to you at the end of the show. Jim, absolute pleasure to have you on the show, sir. It's great to finally meet you face to face. Well, listen, I am delighted to be asked to do this because I've been looking at the channel and you have absolute heroes of mine. And I am there going, what does he need me for? Do I owe him money? You know, <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a fantastic channel. Uh, it's great that keyboard players are finally getting to talk to each other. It's great. No, thank you. And I will check my bank account. Maybe you do owe me money. I'll have to look into that. So I thought, we, I thought we'd kick off, Jim, with you've been a busy man throughout your whole career, but just over the last 12 months, um, you've been up to a bit alone. Tell us about what your last 12 months has been like. Well, it, obviously, the last 12 months have been busy because my kind of end of it, where I ended up falling into um, gigging and all the rest of it is I ended up doing a lot of TV. And the musical skills that I acquired and all that sort of stuff. Really, I found my home in television. And the last 12 months, I've been working with Fox uh, on a show called Name That Tune, which is a classic show. It's been going since the 60s. And during COVID, um, I got asked by a friend of mine in production, said, this American show is coming over. We'd love to talk to you because I had, we can get into it, but I've done a number of television shows and game shows and music shows. Do you know the show? I said, yeah, I grew up on this show. The, the UK version was in, I think, the 70s and 80s. And I met the producers, met the Irish production team, met the UK production team. And I ended up coming on board as the, we, we officially landed on senior music consultant. So essentially, um, the show is a game show, but incredibly for a season. Guess how many tunes you need? How many songs do you need for a season of this show? Well, how many How many episodes are there, Jim? Sort of 10 or 12? Yep. Yep. It's like, well, maybe like 15 to 20 because they're, you know, you, you do blocks. Yeah, so I'm guessing. I mean, what do you say? Oh, I think you'd have to have yeah, a what, 20. Yeah, a couple of hundred. Yeah. 800 songs. Oh, oh, my God. And you'll play. 800. This, this show eats music because there's different rounds, but one of the rounds, the band play, and someone could buzz in in two seconds. Now, the amount of work that's gone into putting together 30 seconds, 35 seconds of that song, it's gone in two seconds. So it yeah. eats music. And you're also, that's the 800 for show. 
Uh, when I come on board, way before the band, you know, come on board, we're looking maybe at a pool of 1,500, 1,700 songs that you're working with, going through with the producers. You're trying out new games. Like, yeah. Everything from is like they'd be asking you, how gettable is this song or what section of this song or how could we make this song like there's a remix round. So they might ask for ideas like before the band even come near it. Can we do Love is in the Air as a hip hop tune or what, what would that sound like? And wow. so a lot of the pre-production would be going through these songs, finding these songs, finding the sections, doing test mock ups myself and in my studio and I have a bass player guitarist friend in his studio and we'd be sending back mock-ups and they'll try new games and then by the time we're approaching where the band will come come on board it's kind of firmed up to what games we're going to be playing and then I would be the liaison because I can speak music to the musicians you know and speak television to the musicians and I can speak dumb it down and speak music and TV to the TV people because, yeah, um, yeah. TV production and musicians sometimes can, and because I've worked in both worlds, I can take what the TV guys are saying and translate that down to for the band. And when the band have an issue, I can talk to sound and talk to TV and say, here's why it's not just a diva thing. This is important. No, the guitarist cannot change it to the other side for a shot he can't just go i'll do this you know yeah yeah. and no he can't just have a banjo because it looks cool this require you know stuff like that but it, it's been a lot of fun i did god i did four seasons i think season four is currently running in the states it's hosted by the legend randy jackson who is oh, incredible wow. to work with like randy is just the best and Randy would essentially be the band leader. He sits at a piano for the show and he does different things. But Randy's great to work with. And of course, his musical knowledge is unbelievable, unparalleled. He's a brilliant bass player, of course, but also production. And like you're, you're, you might be doing a Whitney Houston song and you suddenly realize, hang on, he's the guy who did, Woo, I want to dance with somebody. Woo. And so that was, for me personally, I really enjoyed working with Randy. And then the the host is Jane Krakowski, who is from 30 Rock and Broadway and you name it. And she is, she's a lot of fun. One, she's an incredible singer, incredible performer, and she's great fun. So they host the show. There's a full band behind, and we've done celebrity episodes, and we've done... uh, ordinary people episodes because there's i think 150 to 180 grand up for grabs per episode so i wanted to play the game i would have earned more money going in as a contestant but they're very strict rules so it 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 was great and a lot of music you know and it was a great way of kind of reconnecting with some old music that i'd know but also lots of new music and because it's the american market and uh, there were some acts who I wasn't even aware of. And the joy of sitting here in my studio and they say, we want songs by X and X. And you're thinking, never heard them. And you suddenly discover these great artists, great songs. So it, it, it's been a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. I will say that it's uh, really a lot of work. But very Yeah, I, I was going to you ask know, you about that, Jim. Just, just listening to you describe your role. And, and what was involved, like, well, my head was spinning just, just hearing you talking about it. Um, so clearly a lot of work. Um, how are you able to manage your, your time and your workflow to, to uh, A, get your, your head and your ears around all those songs, but then all those liaison roles that you have as well, and then no doubt things don't always go 100% smoothly, so there's things you have to iron out. So just lovely to get an insight into how you make that all work. So basically every hour of the single day of, of the day while you're in production, it's very heavy because, because there's a US component to it and there's also an Irish UK component. I would be in my studio maybe at eight in the morning and you would be listening to the songs they're thinking about cutting test cuts, you know, 30 seconds here, lead ins, you know, the band, they're going to need that bar or two bars in, especially vocalists, 
just coming in. Um, and then you, you basically would do that during the day and then the Americans would come online at five o'clock and you would have your meeting with the Americans and it, it's a show and tell. I became an expert at Zoom and good audio over Zoom. And you would sit and say, here's the idea. Here's the song. And um, they obviously, you know, they will have opinions. And you, you, you have to be able to take their, let's say, concerns or their lack of musical knowledge and explain the whys. Like, there's a reason why this needs to be this way. And I have to say, very lucky with the, 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 the people who were the executive producers. And, um, you know, after, I'd say, about two weeks, they really start to trust you and then lean on your expertise, you know? And, and then it's just a case of, okay, let's get this machine rolling. And you would be maybe send off a couple of cuts. They come back with notes. Americans love notes. Producers love giving notes. You set aside some time then to address those notes, try different things. So if we were doing a, there's a round called Golden Medley, and this is the end of the show. It's big money. 30 seconds to recognize seven tunes, okay? But there's no vocals. There's no lyrics. So for that, you have to specifically look for songs that are classic, really well-known, either very strong melodically or else have a very strong sonic signature, if you know what I mean by that. In other words, uh, take, for example, Take On Me, right? They want to do a ha take on me. Now, the obvious thing normally would be the chorus. But if you strip everything out vocal wise and you have a guitar playing the melody line, ding, 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 to a normal person, they mightn't get it. And remember, if they want to win the money, they've got to get these songs within four seconds. So I would say to them, in that case, your intro. You know, ba da da da. That's going to be the bit, and they—it's literally two seconds. So they will obviously have, you know, you'll have that discussion. You'll explain why, and some you get, you win, some you lose. You know, but my job is basically to try and facilis- facilitate the game, the music, the band, the production, TV as much as possible. So on that round, you're looking for like simply the best, another kind of great melody, you know. And you find those songs. Jump, another great one. You're going to use the riff. Hip hop, not so much because there's no melody. But Mm. you can find classic, uh, like The Message or, you know, Rapper's Delight. But you have to allow for, they might say, chic because it's samples. So that gets very kind of complex and money wise. And then, Round one is kind of the easiest. That's where the band sing, and it sounds like the record. The lyrics are there, but they don't say the name of the song. So there you can put in your difficult songs, your, you know, um, your less well-known songs, songs that people know, but they haven't got the title. So the vocalists lead you. So you have to decide when I'm doing the cuts, you go, here's where we come in. You can't say this word. You can't say this word because it's in the title. And that's round one, seven songs. Round two is the iconic bit of note. Uh, You get a clue and then you have 10 notes. And this is just piano. So you don't get the sound of the song. You don't get the lyrics of the song. It's it's an impossible game. And I've explained to them that it's it's an impossible game (laughs) because the old way used to be you get it from the clue or you think you know what it is. So if the clue led you to Tina Turner, you might think, okay, it's going to be either simply the best, maybe river deep mountain high, maybe we don't need another hero, private dancer. So I will bid against you guys because I want to hear da da da. And I go simply the best. So in my mind, I can go as low as three. That's it. So now it becomes a game of trivia and poker bluffing. Because if I think you've gone too low, I go, hey, Paul, name that tune. And finding them, and this is a good exercise for any keyboard players out there or any musicians, try and find songs that are recognizable in only 10-note melodies. Because the frustration, you'll find 
lovely musical phrases that are 12 notes. But you finding those 10 note ones, that's gold dust. And you won't find all 10. So sometimes the notes play and without the clue, even someone with perfect pitch and huge musical knowledge won't have a clue because it's on a piano. So you don't get the vocal slides. You don't get the grace notes. Everything is reduced to da, 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 da. So that's probably the hardest round, guys. That's the one. And finding those, that takes probably the most time, you know? That's that's yeah. that's a tough one. So try it yourself. Yeah, it'd be it'd be a great exercise to try because it just sounds incredibly difficult. And as you say, without hearing a song in the context that you're used to hearing it, it just becomes so much more difficult to pick. But that's the that's the point of the show. And and I understand, Jim, that you did a version on uh, Irish National Radio as well, uh, which was like a, a radio version of Name That Tune, where you were producing. And I believe playing piano in in that as well. So maybe can you describe the difference between doing it live on radio as opposed to producing the TV show? Well, that one was called Tune That Name for legal reasons. And there's a, a presenter called Ryan Tuberty. And I've, I've known Ryan now 20 plus years. And we met together on radio. And he went on to do a lot of TV shows. I worked with him a lot. And basically... He wanted to do something fun on a Friday. And he asked me to come up with some ideas where I could come into the studio, play some piano. We'll improv, we'll rap, we'll just the last Friday of every month. And I suggested, a, a, you know, kind of name that tune, tune that name. And he went great. And the difference was he'd bring on two players on the phone and it was more fun. The clues would be, a lot easier. They were very, uh, I used to try and make them contemporary to the news of the week and very Irish related. But I would give them, instead of giving them 10 notes, I would give them like, you have 25 notes, you know. And we just, all right, go, you have four. It was, it really wasn't about, it was just about having fun on the radio. He'd do an interview with somebody and say, right, Jim, we're back on piano, let's go. Or someone might come on and, and they want to sing. And you go, okay, let's let's sing. You know, it was very improv, very loose, very fun. A world away from the professionalism and the absolute, it's got to be right. You know? Yeah. But Absolutely. it was great. And, and I have to say, that was the enjoyable end of the game because it is a great game. Play it at home. God, if you've got a piano and you, you've been asked to go to a party, Great one. Get Spotify out. Play it, you know. So, yeah, so the yeah. radio end of it was great. It was a lot of fun. I did that for, oh, that, I used to come in once a month for about three years. And then who wow. knew that, that, like, seven years later, I'd get asked to do the full-on big version. But it meant I understood the game. I understood what was needed. You'd be surprised. There's certain songs you think could work for a game. They don't work. It's it because yeah. music is so broad, like so broad, you yeah. know. No, that's so, great, yeah. great insight. Yeah, great insight, Jim. And um, obviously, you don't get to be playing 800 songs in a season from being an accountant. So, tell us about your whole bigger music career starting with the start. So, what was your musical upbringing? What got you into music in the first place? Yeah, so I've, I, I've, I came an interesting route because I didn't have a musical upbringing. Um, I, I had a, I don't really want to be in school upbringing. Um, so when I was about 15, uh, I started mitching, bunking off. I don't know what you call it in Australia. Wagging, <laughs> wagging school, yeah. <laughs> so, so I used to, you know, go into town, into Dublin City. And one of the places you wouldn't get thrown out of uh, was music shops. And... You could just pick up things. So obviously, you know, you pick up a guitar, realize this is impossible. You can't get a sound out of it. Annoy the drum department thinking you're going to be able to play. And then suddenly you realize your hands and feet don't work together. They, drummers, don't mess around. It's out. The keyboard department, there was headphones. And you put on headphones and all it took to get a noise was just press a button. And it sounded perfect. So what I just 
what I would do is go in and by ear, Beverly Hills Cops, cop had come out. So, you know, do, 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 do. And you two, you know, New Year's Day, do, 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 do. So that's what I used to do. I used to go into the keyboards and headphones and just play all day by ear. And then um, was standing at a keyboard with the headphones on playing do, 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 do. And a guy came up. He was going around saying, um, we're holding auditions here tonight in the music shop. Are you a keyboard player? I was 16, school uniform, jacket under it. And I went, yes. Did I own a keyboard? No. But this guy looked cool. This is 1986. This guy was hair and, you know, fabulous looking guy. And he goes, okay, uh, be in, there's a pub just down the road. Uh, be in the pub at seven o'clock. That's where everyone's going to meet. And he went round every single keyboard player or anybody who was standing. I decided this was just going to be a great experience, something different. So I hung around town, tried to go into the pub as a very young looking 16 year old, got thrown out of the pub because I was 16. And uh, I met him and he goes, hey, you can't wait out here. You have to wait inside. And I said, they, they won't let me in. And he goes, OK, you can sit in on the other auditions, but you can't say anything. Sit up the back, you know. And I'm literally just going, OK, OK. And I went in and I saw a selection of guys coming in. And 86 in Dublin. Everyone looked like either Nick Kershaw or, you know, there was hair, jackets. And you've got this schoolboy with like a fringe cut and a jacket sitting in the corner. And I realized kind of quickly that this was a three piece rock band because in 86 in Dublin, everybody wanted to be you too. Okay. But the bass player was the most experienced. And he had said to the guys, if we want to be a chart band, we need a keyboard player. Now, the lead singer, who was also the lead guitarist, uh, he did not want a keyboard player. The drummer, who was his best friend from forever, rocker, you know, the studs, the whole thing, they hated the idea. But they had to agree to hold auditions. So I realized as guys come in who could play and they'd go out, the bass player would go, that guy looks great. He's got a great look. He's great. And they would go, no, no, don't want him. And I was, I might have been 16, but I wasn't stupid. I realized, okay, I see what's kind of happening here because the arguments got more fractious, especially after someone really good came in. And if they were tall and good looking, that made it even worse. The guitarist and drummer did not want them. Eventually it comes to me. And because I know keyboard, but we're in a music shop, they can say you can use whatever keyboard you want. So I grabbed the D50, you know, and they went, okay, um, what song do you know? And I went, uh, well, you must know something. Do, 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 do. And they went, no, 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 no. We're going to play a, a song. Jump in. It's in the key of D. Now, I knew the notes. So, And this is no, no word of a lie. They started playing, and I could recognize when they hit the D. So every time they hit a D, I pressed digital native dance reset <laughs> on D50 that goes <laughs> they would go off into the other chords oh yeah. around again Don't. so it was quite obvious I couldn't really play so they tried two more songs and I just played the one note and eventually the guitarist and the drummer went okay if we have to have a keyboard player, it's him. And the bass player across goes, no offense, kid, but no, this guy can't play. And they went, well, look, we agreed to auditions. We're now voting, you know, that guy. And out of spite, the bass player went, okay, he's the guy. And they went, whoa, whoa, no. And he goes, no, no, no. He's essentially, screw you guys. We're having a keyboard player. He's the guy. And he said to me, we are starting rehearsals in two weeks. 
and then we have gigs. So you need, what, what keyboard do you have? I said, I don't. You need to get a keyboard. I'm going to give you some tapes. You've got two weeks to arrive. We've booked out this place for a week. And you're going to be our keyboard player. And I just went, okay. And I, 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 I went home and looked in my post office account. I had my communion money, my confirmation money. Told my parents I was joining a band and I need to get a keyboard. And I went out and bought a second hand next day, CZ 1000 Casio, and a Oberheim Matrix 6 module. Oh, wow. And that was awesome. my gear. And then l- luckily, uh, I had a friend who was a, a keyboard player and a drummer. And I rang him and I said, um, I'm after joining a band. And he goes, I didn't even know you played, Jim. I said, I don't, but I've joined a band. Can I come across with you? And I brought the tape and he basically started to show me chords, started to show me. And I, I worked like every day recording him playing. And I turned up with the basic right hand only. The left hand was for show or, you know, with the chords. And I rehearsed with them and, you know, basically it was pads, which the guitarist was happy about. I wasn't stepping on his shoulders. Um, but, but that's how it started. And I used to do the rehearsals every day, go home with fresh tapes, learn again. And I mean till two, three in the morning, every single day. And we started gigging. And yeah, I'd come home from a gig practice, get up in the morning, practice, get into the van, go do the gig, practice. I mean, that's essentially it. Because when I did the first gig, I realized this is the best thing in the Mm -hmm. world. They uh, took me in one day. They had a stylist come in. The the bowl just mop got cut into a kind of highlighted Howard Jones thing. I got flashy jackets. I got stuff. They took moody photographs of me you know Uh, and then you go out and you're on stage with a band and there are i'm 16 just about turn 70 there are girls there are you know there is drink there is parties after the gig there is all these things and i realized i really want to do this so i think i've got this nailed now because i'm living in this little bubble of this Dublin original and some covers band. And we're spending time talking about when we're playing stadiums and when we're doing all this stuff. But I think I've got it nailed because I can play the chords. I'm playing D, you know, triads. And then we had a a bass player join, new bass player. And he wanted to jam before the thing. And he goes, "Um, do you know this song? No. Do you know this song? No. And he plays me this thing and I go, oh my God, what is this? And it's a major seventh chord. And he came from a jazz background. His dad was one of the top session players in Dublin, session guitarists. And he had a proper musical education and like he was into Jacko and he wanted me to play the chords so he could play Teen Town. So suddenly you're learning, oh my God, there's a world beyond the first, third and fifth. There's this sound and he was amazing. He He literally was like my music educator. He gave me tapes. Listen, listen. And then, of course, you go out and you see other bands. And I remember thinking I was great in this band because we were doing really well. It was a good band. You know, we got good reaction. But I went out and saw a band. It was called the Spider Simpson Band. And Jerry Simpson was this keyboard player. And Jerry Simpson, three keyboards around him, both hands going, playing everything sounding everything and i realized oh my god that's a keyboard player i'm not a keyboard player i'm in a band on keyboards yeah i i want to be that and i became friendly with with jerry and uh again so generous there were so many people like so many keyboard players who were so generous to me you know learning showing me stuff and um yeah, that was it. Then that was that was the start. Sure. And very quickly, I realized I want to do this for a living. But unfortunately, in Dublin at the time, working with an original kind of rock band, there's very little money. Very so we had another stand in a, a proper session guy stood in 
I saw what a session player was because when he stood in, um, the, the other guys were a bit standoffish. He was considered a, a breadhead. He's just one of these hired guns and we're not like that. And I had the set list written out and some rough chord charts to try and help him. And I was going, so we're going to be playing. And he just, uh, just gives it up the list. Yeah, yeah, great. And I was thinking, I've sweated blood to learn these songs. Like blood. Can this guy really just do it? We did the gig. Spectacular. And I was dropping him home. And he said to me, look, can I give you some advice? You, if you want to do this, you need to join a working covers band, a show band, a something band. Because, you know, you will be tested beyond the 25 songs you now know. And this, it, the, the, these guys' arrangements, you'll be, you know, the pads. And I just went, okay. I trusted him. I, I quit the band the next night and ended up getting a, a pro gig. Just happened to fall into someone was stuck. They heard I was a keyboard player. And suddenly you're thrown into guaranteed four nights gigging, traveling all around the country, traveling the UK with an MD who's going, that's not right, <laughs> you know, and, and straight away you're back into tapes, learning, hours in hotel rooms, improving, 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 getting better. And always, thankfully, I, everybody else in the band was a better musician. And I've always tried to keep that in every single setup I've been in. I've always wanted to be in a setup where there's at least two or three people who are better musicians because then you are, one, enjoying what you're doing because they sound great, but you're also learning. And then did a few months with that band, really got my feet under me, and then landed a really good gig. Uh, a girl, a woman called Linda Martin who had went on to win the Eurovision, and Linda did a lot of great gigs and had a great set and paid very well. And that was kind of me up and going then. And then you're getting time to do, you're getting asked to do session because by that stage I'd bought the D50. I'd bought the M1. There was only about two of us with M1s in the country at the time. I think there was Jim Core and myself. I took over from Jim Core from Linda's band. So he went on to form the course with his, with his sisters. Oh. Yeah, and Jim, I'd gotten to know Jim, and um, I he it was Jim who actually said you should join this band and put put me forward, and I had the same keyboard, so it sounded the same, and um, I got a lot of kind of session work then because I had an M1 and a D50, and again I know it's harder for younger keyboard players to understand this. Everyone now has a home studio. Everyone can record quality audio midi in those days it was you were lucky if you had a four track and you literally had to play it you know there was no midi recording except in the bigger studios so i ended up then playing with loads of different people and you'd go in and you'd, you know this is what we want and off you go you just need to know i need to know jim sorry how many sessions you did during that period where you actually got to use digital native dance all of them because it was the great thing where you could go do what you want but also have you heard this <laughs> it was just kind of it's funny you would get asked for house piano a lot you get asked for certain sounds um, and a, a great time used to be around Eurovision and Eurovision was always a big deal in Ireland we've had seven winners and uh People putting in songs for the Eurovision would have to hire a studio and songwriters would need musicians. And I ended up doing a load of, you know, sessions around that time. Very funny. You get some good songs, but you'd also get pretty crazy people who want to put in yeah. a song for Eurovision. And it's worth, and it, it's worth probably, it's probably worth interrupting there, Jim, for our international listeners that, uh, in particularly in the US and Canada that may not understand Eurovision. It is such an iconic competition and such a great hotbed of new songs. And, and as Jim's mentioned, Ireland's produced a bunch of great artists, including one of the world's greatest bands in all of rock and pop history, Jedward. I love Jedward. I will not have a word said against Jedward. And in fact, when I, I I'll just tell this, 
quickly. Um, I, I did a, a TV, I was the musical director of a TV show for 14 years, The Late Late Show in Ireland. It's the longest running live show. So this is a live, there's no delay, live show, a uh, mix of interviews, music. It's a two, two hour show, two and a half hour show sometimes. And we had artists come in all the time that we would play with or whatever. <clears throat> Jedward obviously had made an impression on, uh, was it X Factor? Was that the? Yeah, it was one of them, yeah. X Factor's Britain Got Talent. And we had dealt with a lot of Simon Cowell acts, let's say. And they would always be sent over with a minder, right? And I think most musicians will appreciate this. Musicians get on. Oh, great. There's only trouble when they have people to get in their way. And I mean famous musicians and famous singers. They're normally really good people, you know, because they've been around a long time. And, you know, they're nice people, but they have people. And sometimes those people can be awkward. And the guy who had, who came into the studio, hello, hello, sorry, I am such and such with Simon Cowell. Um, we will be bringing Jedward in. Uh, please, we don't want you bothering them for autographs, pictures. And I'm looking around at the lads in the band. Like we were a five-piece band and we had played with, you know, Rod Stewart, Tom Joe, you, you, we played with a lot of people and we're thinking, really? This guy thinks we're going to be looking for autographs? And, you know, so, so he gives the whole, you know, they, they will come in and they will sing, but please do not talk to them. Please do not. So we're going, yeah, yeah, great. I, we're on stage and I'm running the play-ons, right? Like as in the walk-on music for whatever acts. The guys exploded, is the only word I can use, into the studio. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's late, late. And then Ron Upman, oh, my God, it's Jim. We love you, Jim. You're the best, Jim. And I'm going, what? What? You're the best, Jim. Her mom was your English teacher. <laughs> I'm thinking, What? What? It turns out, yes, yes, their mother was my English teacher. And in fact, she suspended me <laughs> from school. I tried to get me expelled. But they had been fans of they, their mom, because I had done a, another TV show prior to all of that called The Lyrics Board, which we can talk about if you want, which where I ended up on camera as in one of the hosts and captains. And it was very popular in Ireland. It got a lot of figures. We did four years, five years of that. And they were big fans of that. So suddenly, the guys who no one was supposed to speak to wanted to get pictures with me and, you know, record messages. I love it. So they are the nicest guys. They really are. I know they get a lot of stick. And in fact, oh, that's um, during COVID, they came into the Late Late Studio and normally, they would, you know, sing with a backing track and do whatever they would have to do. But they came in and sang live, live guitar, live vocals. They'd never done it before. Um, I got a call to come in during COVID to work with them and play the piano on it. And they did uh, Everybody Hurts by oh, R.E.M. Wow. And it was really sweet. Honestly, I have a lot of time and affection for these guys. And I'm They've made a success out of what they've had. So hats off. Exactly. exactly. And I totally withdraw any sarcastic tone from my <laughs> comments about Jen <laughs> What's What's funny is, I mean, and I think it's for, for most kind of professional musicians, my a red flag will always go off for me if someone says, oh, I hate this type of music. All right. You know, it's music is music. And in any genre, yes, there's, there's genres of music I don't like. Or don't like to play. But I guarantee you, within that genre, there are killer tunes. There's something mm -hmm. that is spectacular, either musically, emotionally, sonically. So to dismiss a whole thing or music, it's a red flag. Because Great. I think music is music, no matter how you make it. Whether it's pop, rock, jazz, fusion, hip-hop, 
and it doesn't matter. We, as musicians, we're trying to do something with uh, sound and emotion and lyrics. And so I might be a fan of like Irish traditional music because it doesn't have a keyboard in it. It's fiddles, flutes, you know, and they play a lot of unison stuff. But my God, there's some amazing melodies. There's some incredible virtuoso players. So I can appreciate it. And there would be certain pieces that I absolutely adore. But would I drive, you know, to a gig listening to four hours of trad? No. But would I go and jump in on a trad session? I have. I brought a bear on just to experience it because Sorry. I wanted to experience what was it like. So I went and bought a bear on drum. Uh, people who know it's an Irish drum. You get a stick. And I taught myself how to make enough noise, not too loud, to be able to go in to a session. And how a session works is a bunch of musicians are in a bar. You ask politely, can you join? You sit down and they play through their repertoire. And I sat there just tipping away just to feel the rhythms, the vibe. And it was an experience. Am I going to be a professional baron player? No. Will I ever do it again? No. But at least I had an understanding of how these guys jump from tunes, how they count. They're not counting in four. They're not, there's no obvious changes. It's nods, it's winks, it's feel, it's someone takes up a melody. So when for a TV show like the Late Late Show, we had the tribe players in, well, I could sit in if they wanted pads or a bit of piano. You would at least be sympathetic. You would have an understanding of what you're trying to do what's supposed to shine in this production you know so it's it's all music to me i love it i absolutely love it yeah so so jim this is probably a good point to ask you the next the next obvious question so, you know speaking of switching genres what then was the transition from you becoming obviously a very busy session player to then moving into the world of of tv which you've you've had a very extensive career in how did, what occurred for that change to happen so I did my first kind of television show in, I think it was 1989, which was a special for this singer, for Linda Martin. It was Linda Martin live at the Gaiety Theatre. And that was my first experience of having cameras, blah, 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 and the pressure, <laughs> the sheer unmitigated pressure because it's being recorded. And again, we're, we're, Years before YouTube, people are now used to your live performances turning up somewhere. If a mistake happens, band fail will trend. But we're back to where it went out on telly. And unless you were rich and had a video recorder, it, it only happened for those people who saw it. But we had a full audience and um, I enjoyed it, but it was so nerve wracking. It really was nerve wracking. And then I got a couple of calls to do the Late Late Show as, you know, one-offs. Just they need a band or they need, you know, one-offs. So I'd done kind of a few one-offs. And then I got a call about a show called The Lyrics Board, right? And The Lyrics Board is an Irish show developed in Ireland, but it's currently in 26 countries, right? It's really popular. And the idea is two teams, each team as a team captain who was a piano player and hopefully a singer. I wasn't. I didn't tell them that, but we leave that. Um, so two piano players and you would have two guests. Each piano player has a guest each side of them. Celebrities for the most part, but hopefully the odd celebrity singer because it's a music game. And when you hear how this game works, you'll actually, you'll go, how does this, how did you even do this? The idea is there's a board with six words and they're numbered one to six and you have to pick a number. So you guys are on my team, right? I've got David on this side, Paul on the other. There's a team over there. And I go, David, pick a number. And you go one. And it reveals the word love. Now, we obviously don't know what the song is. Right, that we're trying to guess. That's what we're ultimately trying to guess. The lyric, it's a lyric from some song. But to keep control, you then go, have to sing a song with love. 
So you would turn to me and go, okay, uh, we'll do Love Me Do. And I have got to go, what key? Love. And you sing it. Oh, and we wow. might do a verse or a chord, just to hold control. And then you'll go, great. Let's pick it. We've kept control of the board. Now, it had a house band at the top, right? And basically, if we guess the song, so the song was maybe Love Is In The Air, Everywhere I Look Around was the lyric. The band then had obviously rehearsed the song and you or Paul would do a proper performance with the band, with the two pianos. But to get to that point, I had to literally be able to pull out any song. Mm -hmm. We only had to do enough of it to, to keep control. But by God, there's nights I wake up in a sweat thinking, like, God, if I was asked to do this. And I did it out of pure, I don't know, I got asked to do it. I said yes, thinking, what's the worst that can happen? They'll fire me before, you know, the, it goes to air. They're going to do a, a you know, a pilot uh, run through. But I got through that. And then suddenly I found myself hosting as one of the team captains. You're under pressure. And we yeah. would shoot maybe two shows a day, three shows a day, you know. So I remember someone saying to me, ah, it's, it's got to be uh, all rehearsed and rigged. And I go, well, if you've ever worked in TV, you know that it takes them an hour to rehearse one tune. Cameras, sound. We are doing 30 songs, at least snippets per show, three shows. That's like 60, 70, 80. So no. And believe me, have you seen the show? Because sometimes it completely falls apart. Yeah, so... That was a great show. That was an absolute, like, very, very popular. And and I'm, ple I'm pleased to report, Jim, that um, there are multiple episodes of it on YouTube and we'll be definitely finding the ones with you in it and linking to it in the show notes. Um, so they well, are on there. I'll, I'll give you a couple of kind of behind-the-scenes things. One is uh, I was a clean-shaven young man, a child at the time, boy, but I decided to grow the biggest mustache and weirdest facial hair for one reason because i discovered that if you're on television like that in ireland you are recognized everywhere you go and i was also working with other bands and i because this thing would be shot over maybe six to eight weeks but it would run for the year and you would have people coming up shouting at you play this do this and I didn't like it. I absolutely hated being recognized. I hated it. Phones were starting to become popular. The, uh, you know, they were starting. And you'd be trying to work and try to do stuff and you'd have people just, I, I didn't like it. So I grew amazing facial hair, right? And the moment we finished recording the series for the year, I would... <laughs> in the hope I could just go and live my life because I was away in, I was away in Spain with my family and we went to a bar and it's got a big screen and we're having a pint and a bit of food. And I yeah. hear the theme tune and I hear me going, well, tonight my guests are going to be, you know, and I'm thinking, Oh my God, you, can, you know, you can't go anywhere. And I remember there was guys at the bar looking at me, looking at me playing because people assume it's all happening live. Yeah. And right. they're looking and they're looking and, they're and eventually, over they come. I'm on holidays. And they're like, that's you, isn't it? And you go, yeah, 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 yeah. Where are you staying? Will you come and sing a song for us? Will you do the whole business? I decided when I got asked to do other TV things, because as a Z-list celebrity now, official Z-list, you get asked to do what was the equivalent of dancing with the stars back then or, you know, and I, I, I actually went, no, I, I prefer to work behind the scenes. It wasn't for me. It's not that you're paid loads of money, you know, it's paid well, but I'm thinking I don't like being famous and I know shows only last four years. So I really don't want to be the guy who used to be, and you're doing cooking shows, makeovers. No. So I ended up moving to the back, you know, behind the scenes. I, I also direct and I edit and I write and stuff. But um, I ended up then working with the TV production companies. 
And that's where opportunities like you're working with them and they go, we're doing this show. Jim, can, do you compose? Yeah. And usually, as I have always done, I go, yes. Did I? No. But yes, I do. And that's, and, I mean, that's where, that's where the true um, immortality is with music, particularly in TV, is you're writing the themes. And I was going to ask you about that. So obviously you've written a number of, of themes and co compo composing. Tell us how, aside from saying yes, how did you develop the skill set for that? Yeah. See, this is the thing about, because of the way I got into, got into the, the business, right, got into it. I always said, I have to go back and train. I've got to do some proper education. But I was busy working and touring. And it's not, I'm, I'm, believe me, I'm not one of these guys who goes, I'm self-taught. Am I great? You don't need to do. I'm actually the guy going, I wish when I was seven, we'd own the piano. I wish that I had, you know, learned this stuff. And in fact, it's, I'm learning all the time. I've, all, I've taught myself to a certain level, but I'm thinking now, to be honest, post-COVID, about looking more into proper compositional um, education. It's something that I would say, yes, you know, if you're a keyboard player and you're lucky enough to have done a proper music education, there's still loads you can learn. If you haven't and fell in the door and play by ear, Never dismiss the idea of improving your technique, improving your method in working with other people. It's one of the joys of it. Like I am still learning every single day. I will learn something new and YouTube and your, your site is incredible for it. You get so much insight and you've got those isolated tracks that run. So education is there. So for me, I said, yes. I knew I could hear what I wanted. I did a theme tune and I basically said to the guy, cause I was working with this production company and I said, look, I'm going to do you something. If it doesn't work for you, no harm, no foul, just go. No, I'm doing it for no money at the minute. If you want it, yes, you pay me, but I'll do it. And if it doesn't, you can go to one of the usual people who do this. So I had Cubase and a bunch of modules and a bit of MIDI, you know, and I, I, played what I heard and learned it up. And I, I said, there, there's your theme tune. And he went, great. We need a few incidental bits of music as well for under beta. Okay. So I go, okay. And I go back and do that and, and, you know, sweat blood over it, wishing I had the, the compositional knowledge to go, yeah, it's in D. So I'll do this and here's the way I'll learn this and this will work with this and then I'll module it. It's all by ear. Does this work? Try this, try this. But it worked out and I ended up doing a good few theme tunes, a documentary, and uh, it was just going to be keyboard. The budgets are small in Ireland. Budgets, you know, really the only money in this is for feature films, maybe drama. And it's such a small market. Like it, there is literally one or two guys. That's kind of it. You know, or there was at the time. And with TV, there was space in that thing. If you could do it cheaply, quickly, and where you made your money was not in what you were paid to record or compose. The, the, the budgets were small. It was in the, your royalties. So it might be a year before you're in profit. It depends how popular the show was. You will definitely put more work in, well, I did, put more work and time in than the fee. Here is the fee to supply this. And then, you know, if the show airs multiple times and, you know, check comes in, you suddenly go, hey, that's that show. Great. And then suddenly, yay, I actually feel like I've been paid now. And if it runs for another two years, you're kind of going, wow, oh, this is great. Like there's a, a bit of music that I did. I'd forgotten I did it. I was looking at a, a return. It's somebody used it in, in the Netherlands. I don't know. I, I got, you know, so that was, you know, the way I did a good bit of that. But then, and I think, again, a changing world. Um, I did a lot on spec because I felt that was the best way to do it. You know, because some people would want multiple, 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 multiple changes. And I don't mean changes that make sense. It could be 
something so off the wall, you end up just wasting way too much time. So I was trying to do it in my way, which was, I'll do you what you want. I'll listen to what you want to say. I'll try and address that. But if we're getting into, what if the guitar was a bagpipe? What if it was happier? You know, you'd lose your life. But if they took it, then I would sign the deal and on we'd go. But what changed, and I remember it, um, getting a contract from a company to do the theme tune. And there was an extra couple of sections. And I had seen that in the UK, composers were giving out that production companies now weren't giving you the buyout fee. So you you two ways of getting paid. I write this music for you, but I don't own it. You own it as the production company. That fee would want to be really big, right? In Irish TV, they didn't have those budgets. So the other way was, we'll give you X amount, but you continue to own the tune. You're licensing it to us. And you get the royalties. But some accountant somewhere obviously looked at the figures and went, who's getting this money? And someone went, oh, it's the composer, but it's okay because we don't pay it. It comes from Imro or whatever you're, you know, it comes from people paying license fee. And they went, no, we should have that money. It's our television show. So they start writing in that they would own the music but they weren't willing to pay the proper buyout fee. And I had heard about that from a friend in the UK. And sure enough, those contracts started to arrive. And it became then unviable. I just decided I'm not doing that. You know, and also library music was becoming much more widespread. And that's the big change. If you look online now, you can join these sites, pay. $50 $50 and you get the license to use music online on TV. And there is hundreds and hundreds in every genre because technology has given everybody a home studio. Sample libraries have given people access to really good sounds, you know, really good sounds. So now people aren't getting bespoke music for your regular TV show or reality show because they need to have a license for a line and they can get this license really cheaply. So when that started to happen, I decided I said no to the next two things. Uh, I won't say what company, but one ended up going with a very big company and it was going to a different couple of different countries. And my check arrived in my first check and there was pages and pages of documentation. And at the end was the check, and the check was for one dollar twenty five. <laughs> and it cost it cost more to print and post yeah, yeah. <laughs> the thing. So I think that was that was where I kind of went, no, I think I'm 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 done with this end of the business. And I just moved on then. I, I you know, I just you know said no. But strangely enough, I'm again COVID caused a bit of a rethink. I've gotten back into wanting to write music now and i don't know exactly Mm -hmm. where that's going to go it it, it won't be for tv because the money isn't there it might just be for my own joy but i i'm going to maybe start looking at games games uh, Mm -hmm. and soundtracks and music games people seem to really um have an interest in working with composers and you know so it's just something that's on my you know radar at the moment is getting mm. back into actually writing music because just to kind of doing that end of the TV and working with production companies meant uh, opportunities arose to do things. And I suppose a lot of the, my time in television was as the musical director of a house band. First, it was a show called Turbity Tonight. The guy we used to be on the radio with, he got a TV show. And he wanted, because there was nothing like this in Irish television, he wanted a live house band and convinced the powers that be, I should have a show. It'll look modern. It'll look like an American chat show. And and the band I was with at the time was called the Camembert Quartet. It was a five-piece quartet. And Ryan, the presenter, he loved the band and loved the kind of messing that we used to do. And it was a kind of an improv fun band 
with some really good players though but it was a, a fun improv satirical band we do lots of stuff and uh we had a song that he particularly liked and it was called boy bands are c word right uh like i don't want to say it on your podcast but <laughs> we could never play it on air it had that word in the 74 because you know it, we had a lot of boy bands in ireland and we wrote it for a bit of fun but it became very popular and got, got passed <laughs> around a lot he got to know us then you know and, and then when he got the tv show he brought us on and it was a live Aaron 15 interview and musical guests and madness would happen. And again, live show. So we would have things like Brenda Fricker, Oscar winner, would say during the interview with Ryan, I love your band. I've always wanted to play drums. And Ryan would go, go ahead. So Brenda Fricker, then our Oscar, come across and we went to a break. And on the break, I'm sitting with Brenda Fricker saying, can you play drums? And Brenda goes, no. So I said, well, what can you do? And she goes, mm. so I said, great. We came back doing all right now with Brenda Fricker. All right. We gave her a cowbell and she's behind the kid. She had the best time. And it was that type of show where guests would just come over and sing with us. Michael Fassbender. Amazing. We got him up to sing some Beatles stuff and no rehearsals. So you need that tight. So the experience of the lyrics board was good for me, but also the, the band yeah. were amazing. The other guys, the drummer, bass player, keyboard player, second keyboard player, who was a brilliant sax player, Doc O'Connor and, and Paddy uh, was on guitar, Paddy Cullivan. Um, these guys could play anything. I trust these guys in any situation. They were amazing, which meant we were fearless. So if someone wanted to do something we, live, we just go, okay, let's do it. And we give ended up go, with some, yeah. give it a go. Like Jack Black, we played him out with Highway to Hell and he's supposed to come out and head for the the presenter. He didn't. He came out, headed for the band and we had rehearsed the, the first 11, 15 seconds. But now he's singing. So all of a sudden you're on live television, you're doing Highway to Hell and let's hope it goes well because if it doesn't, band fail, YouTube. Well, and that's probably the ideal time. That's the ideal time, Jim, to say our, our traditional question of a train wreck. I can imagine in that madness, you must have had some fun times. What was any a notable time when things didn't go well? I, I will reveal all that when these people are dead because yeah. <laughs> we got away with a lot of stuff that you wouldn't notice. It's a train wreck. It's suddenly, well, not so much a train wreck. We're off the rails. You know, we're, we're, we're flying. Really, the, the bad things or the, the train wrecks happened w at the start of my career. And most of that stuff is either stuff that happens getting to the gig or after the gig. Strangely enough, I've had guns pointed at me a number of times, right? Which is, I was only thinking about it because you'd ask about like what, when things have gone weird on the road or a train wreck. And yeah, like in the 80s in Ireland, you have to remember it wasn't a good time between North and South. And my first trip to play the North after the gig, we got pulled out of the van and, you know, guys putting guns and not, not a happy time. And we were imported down the night that the, they blew the center out of the town. And as we were trying to get out of there as fast as we could, we went the wrong way down a one way street in a big stretch black limo and ended up, car coming towards us the driver skidded essentially blocked the road and then luckily the guys were all plain closed armed so they thought it was an ambush so they all jumped out with guns and we're really going we're a band we're a band this guy he's dicky rock he's a singer you know so there was hairy moments traveling and touring and i was in the lebanon and we were we were with the UN essentially entertaining the troops, but we'd gone off with a couple of soldiers outside the the base and the Hezbollah were doing a roadblock and suddenly your two guys had brought me and the guitarist shopping up the mountains to show the mountains are basically running a checkpoint at Hezbollah because they were kidnapping at the time. Terry Waits had been kidnapped and and suddenly the guys are okay, guns out and and you go through. So, you know, 
it's more the getting there, yeah. coming out that I've had weird experiences. Musically, I was thinking right back to getting a call. Uh, it's time I owned the M1. And a guy rang me saying he was at a venue which was only 10 minutes from my house. And he said, Jim, really stuck. It's a, a, a cabaret, you know, but you'll know most of the songs. They're easy. Uh, really, really stuck. I need you like now. And I thought, well, I don't know what I was only, I wasn't playing that long, you know. I said, I don't, and he said, no, no, it's really, it's dead simple. And don't worry, like, it's really just to make sure we have enough people and blah, blah, blah. And I go, okay. And I arrived, and sure enough, the drummer who'd rang me is setting up, but the rest of the stage is empty. And I went, where's the rest of the band? And he goes, no, no, it's just me and you. Uh, so left hand bass and and I meet the singer who's this big larger than life character who's going okay I'm going to do American Trilogy Elvis I'm going to start with that we do the full thing New York New York these immense tunes and I'm thinking but no like left hand bass my left hand at that stage was good at the bender that was it you know I could do the bender the modulation and maybe hit a root note with the chord I was still at that stage and I'm panicking. I'm literally dying in sweat trying to explain this. And the drummer's going, don't worry, it'd be great. And he was going, don't worry. Uh, America Trilogy, I wish I was in the land of... Club. And then the worst thing happens. My M1 killed itself and initialized all the sounds. So oh, if you know what initialized M1 sounds like, it's... It's just stuck. a piano, isn't it? Oh, it's I... not even that. It's just a gong, gong. Oh, that's right. <laughs> gong. And I had... There's this is you didn't have a computer to be able to reload in your stuff. I should have had a card, right? There was a, a thing, but I didn't. I'd never bought one of those. So now I'm doing this gig, which is packed with all these 60, you know, 50, 60, 70 year olds. This guy in the full dress suit, loads of hair, a drummer, and me with an M1. Gawk, gawk, gawk. And we're doing New York, New York. No bass player. It was a night, it was the nightmare. And in fact, I woke up times after that thinking I was back there. The lesson is, this guy was such an amazing entertainer, right? That the gig went brilliant. The audience loved it, yeah. It was like, they loved him. And I'm thinking, how? Doc, 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 doc. He covered, he sang, he told jokes, he did all this. Suddenly an hour and 15 is gone and we're, good night, God bless you, good night. So it was a weird lesson. Lesson one is always ask who's going to be there. Never trust a drummer. Never trust a musician <laughs> saying it'll be great. Second lesson was always have a backup. Mm -hmm. Whether that's a backup keyboard. And now, thankfully, in today's world, we can bring USB sticks. We can bring computers. We can bring things. And third lesson was get behind an amazing front frontman singer and if you're doing live gigs that's where entertainment will come from and your job mm. is to support that in whatever way and don't get too hung up on the minutiae you know unless it's a recording unless it's something specific other than that you know enjoy what you do play good music play with good people you know and i've been lucky like i've i've like doing Five years of Turbidity Tonight as the, the the house show band. We got to play with great people. And then Ryan got the Late Late Show. And that show in his existence had never had a house band because there would always be three or four musical acts brought in to perform. And Ryan convinced them when he was taking the job, we should have a house band. And we can supplement the core five piece with brass, with the full orchestra with this and he sold it i don't know how he did it because mm. it had had it gone for 35 years without that and suddenly we got to do that gig and that was great because you're playing the theme tune it's live you're playing on guests it had the ability for if a guest did want to perform it could happen so we have the russell crowe footage which i think is on youtube and you can see that's unrehearsed and live because 
they didn't even have a microphone for him and Ryan is filling and, you know, you've got these bizarre scenarios mm -hmm. where it happens. But you also have, you find out, you get a call saying, Nick Kershaw will be in next week's show. You're, you know, you're doing Wouldn't It Be Good. And you're thinking, as a keyboard player who had suggested this song, probably every band he was in, but everybody went, nah, it's too hard, you know. You're going to finally get a chance to do it. And yeah, yeah. I remember that week putting so much work into prepping. Like, I mean, kitchen sink. I wanted this to be perfect. And Nick, Ker Nick comes in for the rehearsal. And this shows you what type of guy he is. And I'd watched some footage of it. I found some stuff. But it was always a version of it. It wasn't. It was a version. When he played it live, it was the band kind of did whatever. Kind of, you know. And he, he was so nice. He came in and he goes, oh, great. Lovely to meet you. Okay, so it starts in D minor. And this shows you how humble the guy is. He was willing. He assumed that, you know, he wanted to sing it live, but he would have to teach the band. And I went, uh, Nick, I, we've, we've learned it. Would you like to hear what we've done with it? And if you want to change it, if you want to do something different with it, we can do that. But do you want to hear what we have first? And then, with it? and he goes, oh, you've, oh, great. When I say we played it, it, it was perfect. And the bit, you know, that don't want to be here no more. Our own. And there's the... Well, Nick live normally covers that by just kind of going... Tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick. But suddenly he heard the sound. And that's the moment for me was where he just turned around in the rehearsal and just went, okay. And then when we hit the solo, which is a sax and guitar, we had one of the best sax players in Ireland playing it, Derek Doc. So suddenly we blast into the solo. But da 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 And that, for me, was the joy of being able to do that show week after week after week. You get to, Tom Jones would be in, and suddenly you find yourself playing behind this charismatic phenomenon. It's, it's, I've played with some good front men, and you feel the energy, but Tom Jones yeah. seems to just send it everywhere and again a great lesson he arrives in for rehearsal and it's hello i'm tom hello hello i'm tom we all know he's tom jones <laughs> but but he is around so long and the reason why people want to work with him and wanted like in the 80s when he had his resurgence is because i guarantee you anyone who worked with tom in the 60s and 70s had a great time and when they were working with, let's say, a less appreciative type act, a manufactured act who weren't really doing and were just problems, they sat in the office and went, Jesus, do you remember when it was fun with Tom? Someone, and they rang him and said, hey, would you sing The Art of Noise? Would you do Kiss by Prince? That's why people wanted to work with someone like that. So he came in, introduced himself, made everyone feel good. We, we did the songs, thanked everyone. And, you know, you, you kind of went, that's the way it should be. And different musicians yeah, yeah. walked in the door. Paul Carrick from Squeeze. I mean, how much fun to get to play, you know, how long and tempted with this guy, you know, from Michael yeah. the Mechanics and Squeeze, Paul Carrick. And the first time he came in, I think he was on piano and I was doing strings and something else. And the next time he came in on Hammond and I'm on electric piano, the other guy's on strings. And every single week, you would get to play with some amazing people. And it could be all well, I mean, styles. You, That's the thing. You've worked with so many, so many, Jim, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, people like Sinead O'Connor, Rod Stewart, you know, and, and some of those big names you've mentioned. It's just, it's, it's been an amazing, uh, amazing achievement and amazing career you've had in TV. And, um, and I think that, that's a, a good time to ask you, uh, with all those great people and great artists that you've worked with, and I hope David gave you warning of this question. We love to ask all our guests, what are their five Desert Island discs that they could not live without? So oh, your, your, your five favourite albums of all time. Uh, impossible question. I know everyone hates this, but uh, what have you got for us? It's impossible. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to cheat because I'm going to say the first one is a compilation. The best yeah. of Trevor Horn. Yeah, because good one. How could you how could you pick a Trevor Horn album? In terms of influences or in terms of people I most admire, 
you look at the body of work, you look at the music he's created. Yes. See, it, it, look, we'd be here all day, you know. So I'm taking the best of Trevor Horn and I'm going to, it's going to be a four CD uh, special because I want, I want Slave to the Rhythm, which is a masterpiece. I want ABC. I want Owner of a Lonely Heart. I want Godly and I could be here all day. So do you accept that? A best of Trevor Horn? I get that true? Brilliant. Yep. It's a deal. The next album, I, I, it's a deal. Okay, the next one, I think it's going to have to be The Night Fly by Donald Fagan. Because, remember I was telling you about the bass player who introduced me to the C major sevens? I heard that album and it just blew me away. One, the complexity, the harmony, chords that I was going, what is, what, what are they doing? But also, it's the perfect album. The space, the arrangement, every single instrument, every single note has its place. From the guitars, the electric piano, with piano, with vibes, with synth, and the cleanliness and groove of the drums and everything. So for me, that album, which I, I had on album, I had on tape first, actually, in a legal copy. Then I went to bought the album. But then I bought the CD, and then I probably bought the CD twice, and then I you know, bought it on iTunes. That's one of those things I revisit, and just to listen to amazing musicians, amazing arrangement, complex harmonies, but still melodic, beautiful melody, you know, and wide range of sound from great electric piano to the, the organ on walk between the raindrops, virtuoso playing, but also groove playing, where it's just chicka, chicka. Ticker, because I'm quite happy to be in my, I'm at my happiest in the middle of a band or an orchestra, right? Of amazing players. And my bit simple that I'm not stressed over. Because then I sit back and just groove if it needs it. And I can enjoy and listen and vibe. That's where I'm at my happiest, surrounded by great musicians playing a sympathetic part or a sympathetic sound uh, that adds to the whole rather than. It's me. I'm playing now. I've never been that player. I've, I am not a virtuoso player. I'm not a solo piano player. I'm a synth keyboard player. That's what I am. I'm not a piano player, but I've had to do it. I'm not a Hammond organ player, but I've had to do it. I'm not a Rhodes player. I've had to do it. I've even had an accordion thrown in my hand. I've done it. Right? Necessity. But I know myself what I am is I'm a, a keyboard synth player who likes collaboration and likes trying to make something sound as well as it can sound. So that's what I am. So I'm going with Nightfly. The th next one is probably a weird one. Johnny Mitchell, Hygier. And the reason why Hygier, because it's, it's, it's not keys. Not, it's, she was the first one I heard. Again, I was introduced to Joni through Hygier and not through Big Yellow Taxi and stuff like that, through that one. And suddenly you're hearing this vocal, this incredible vocal and lyricist. And again, odd chords because of the way she tunes the guitar. So harmony, weird harmony. But for me, it probably started my lifelong love of working with singers. I love a singer. I love someone who's in a great focus because when you're, it's just you and them, you take your cue from their vocal tone, but also the emotion they bring to a song. And that's something about Joni that I just, I don't think anyone does it better. Lyrically, so interesting. Melodically, so interesting. Musically, so interesting. And that album is about her time on the road. You've got Coyote, you've got all that stuff. And at the time, I was doing a lot of traveling. And there's a couple of things that would resonate and with me. So in terms of Picking a great focus to keep, I'm keeping Joni. So Hygiera is my next right. one. Um, the next one is West Side Story, Bernstein's recording. So we're into musicals. Thanks. Yeah. And suddenly, for me, when I heard that, because I was a band guy, so I'm all about synth and band, and then you hear what this guy can do, I'm matched with Sondheim. Again, we're now to lyrics, sound. You listen to something like Mambo, 
that section, the dance at the gym, you listen to tonight, the way he builds the quartet. That was a world opener for me in terms of orchestra. And it led me down the road then of classical because I didn't even go up listening to classical. Then you're hearing the other orchestras. You're hearing Gershwin. You're, you're, you know, so I want West Side Story because I think it's the perfect marriage of melody, arrangement, orchestral arrangement, lyrics, because this is what Sondheim is the master of. The lyrics match the arrangement. When it's sad, it's, it's, you know, one hand, one heart tonight. So that for me is something I will listen to all the time. If it ever, yeah. if it's ever on, I'll always go and see it. It's incredible that. So West Side Story is that one. And then my last one, I, I, I trouble with the last one. And I, I, I want a compilation again because it's either going to be Ennio Morricone yeah. or John Williams. Yeah. Because when it comes to, I love soundtrack. I love film scores. And those guys are the masters for me. Now, I know like Howard Shaw and Zimmer's and Hans, uh, Hans Zimmer, they are amazing. And there's some great guys. Like there's amazing guys. But when you listen to what Morricone creates, um, which I can't believe he just, he didn't write a piano. He just writes. So you listen to the score for the Spaghetti Westerns and you ask yourself, how could someone hear the ocarina, the noises, the shouts, the using those instruments in such a way and create such an incredible sound? And, and Cinema Paradiso is beautiful. So he's lyrical, he's melodic, he's emotional. Brilliant. And then you come to the master John Williams, yeah. who I don't think anybody does it better. You know, if, if you haven't sat and listened to the E.T. suite or, you know, any of that. So, and they're from two different schools, but they're both melodic. You know, they both carry, like, Williams' themes are amazing. So how does he manage to do something melodically memorable, singable, but yet it works under dramatic uh, underscore as well? So that's what I'd want. I'd want the yeah, hits of, of these guys onto a CD. And then I think I could, you know, I could be happy. You know, I could be yes. happy. I, I have, I have the, the gamut, but I better have a keyboard with me. I better yeah, have that's a right. to play along. To Absolutely. Play along. Absolutely. No, good picks, Jim. Much appreciated. Now, um, acutely, we were out of time, but I want to finish off with um, our quick fire 10. So 10 short and sharp answers to 10 short and sharp questions which you should be used to from your shows. Let's <laughs> play the game. The fly. All right. Uh, first album you ever heard? It's got to be uh, Pat Boone. Cool. Pat Boone. It's your, a Pat Boone, yep. One of my parents. Your most important pre-gig ritual? A sneaky cigarette. Bike That's it. it. <laughs> i got to have a smoke. <laughs> Damn, fair enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you hadn't been a musician, Jim, what do you think your career choice would have been? Strangely enough, I was headed for journalism. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Yeah, oh, there that's, you go. I, I was, I was, I was going that way. You know. <laughs> have you ever used the transpose button? All the time. I am. I have no issue at all. It, it, it's there for a reason. And if I'm going to be more comfortable, especially a last minute change, and a singer arrives in, and you've learnt it, and you're vibing it in the key you've learnt it in but there's an issue vocally and they say, I need to drop it too. Well, yes, I could play it, but am I going to be as comfortable as I was? Am I going to be as tuned in to them? No, I'm going to be transposing in my head. Why? There's yeah. a button that exists for that. Boom, boom. <laughs> now I'm playing it and I'm still focused on the singer. So I have, I, I will never uh, take anyone to task for using a transpose button. No. But, Always remember, let's put it back where it was when you finished. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Jim, if it's possible, the favourite gig you've ever done. Favourite gig. One of my favourites was I got to play with Sinead a few times, Sinead O'Connor. Uh, she came in on the show, and there's a couple of things she did improv, off the cuff, live on telly, and trusted us to go with her. And 
when she got asked to do a show called, it was basically, it was about her, it was her being interviewed, song, interview, song, in one night only, it was called, Sinead O'Connor, one night only, being hosted by a legend in Irish broadcasting called Gayburn, who had hosted the late, he was the king of television in Ireland. He had hosted the late, late for years and years and years and then retired. But he had built a relationship with Sinead and he was going to interview Sinead. And Sinead rang me and said, I've been asked to do this. I want you and the, the boys to be the band. And working with her prior to it, picking the songs, putting it together. And she was going through a difficult time at the time. And when we arrived in studio, you know, on the day rehearsal and we we're going to go straight into the show, it was a bit kind of fractious. There was a lot of stuff going on. But we talked, rather than played, we left, we came back, then we played. We talked, we played. And then when we went to air, uh, she just magically does what she does. No one does it. No one did it like her, you know. And you're there behind her and she's singing Nothing Compares to You and she's singing some strange Irish tune that only she knew at the time. And she wanted a vibe and she just wanted chords and some do what you want, you know, just make it. And you create this thing. It sounded different than the rehearsal, but it was what it was. And it's, mm. it's, yes, it was being recorded, but you don't feel like it's being recorded. We're there with a live audience. And it's funny, she'd go over and talk to Gay and he would ask her maybe something emotional. She'd come back in a different mood and the, the next song. So in terms of a, a, a favorite gig, maybe, yes, it's one of those nights, right. let's say a night. And the other kind of favorite night was finding myself on stage again with a band. And, you know, it, Dublin's a small place. It ended up with, we were playing with Kerry McCarver Lewis, J. Lee Lewis's wife. And we were doing gigs in Dublin in this small bar. And of course, Jerry got up on keyboard, J. Lee Lewis. So I'm on one keyboard, Jerry's on the other. And because it's J. Lee Lewis, every person in Dublin wanted to be there. So Van gets up, Van Morrison gets up, uh, Ronnie Wood from the Stones, Jim Capitapaldi, all these people who were, who were in Ireland because Ireland was very favourable for tax status for artists and it was a good party town. And you're, I'm a young guy and you're playing on stage and you're looking across the stage and it's like legends. And that was a night where I think I kind of said, whatever happens, like yeah. the economy can fall, gigs can fall. I will quite happily sweep the streets during the day to make enough money to be there. Yeah, that was right. kind of seminal. I think at a certain, there's many points where I could have, you know, recessions and stuff where I could mm -hmm. have just gone, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get a good job. I'm going to get paid. I'm going to, you know, make a life. But I think that was a night where I looked across and thought, holy shit, how did I, <laughs> how am I here? That's right. You know? Yeah, it's cool. absolutely. So that, that's, yeah. Those two things, I think, are my two favourite nights. Yeah, that's that's special. Special stories. Thank you for sharing, Jim. What's the favourite city that you've ever played? Toronto. I yeah, think I Toronto. Like, I, I enjoyed New York, right? But I was lucky. We got to see New York at its best. We, we were playing the Paddy's Day Ball in the Hilton, and they gave us the, <laughs> they foolishly gave the band the East Penthouse of the Hilton in New York and <laughs> Manhattan, which is like, you know, glass wall, art deco, grand piano. They gave it to the band for the night, the whole band, because there's six bedrooms or whatever the hell it is. But, so we had a party. <laughs> so New York's a great place. And, but I realized I'm seeing it at its best. The waiter who served us that night is a better musician than anybody at the table. He was waiting and then he was going off to do a jazz gig, right? Incredible player. So I, I like New York, but I knew I don't think I'd have the mentality. I like Dublin is my favorite city. It was during the, the 80s and 90s. But in terms of foreign city, I think Toronto. Yeah, because Toronto, it, had, it had a great vibe, good music scene. And it seemed like you could make a life there as a musician. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah no, Toronto. good pick. Um, have you ever played a guitar, Jim? Yes or no? Yes, I have. Good it's man. Some, it's somewhere in the studio. 
I got to play the guitar and I, I got it. I played it at the start because I only used one hand because I'd only learnt my chords. So that was my first thing in the rock band. Chords, right? And then it got put away in shame. I'd say it got put away. But then I got a call from a TV uh, producer to say, Jim, can you help us out? We're looking to get our hands on a guitar. I said, yeah, I've got one. What? Who's it for? And he goes, it's for uh, Lamal, Kajagoo. And I'm going, oh, really? He goes, yeah, yeah, we're doing an 80s special show. He goes, uh, we've got Lamal. He's going to do, uh, we're going to try and get him to do Too Shy. My other favorite song of the 80s, right? My other absolute holy grail. And I said, okay, have you booked the band? And he goes, yeah, yeah. Two keyboard players, one keyboard, uh, one keyboard player. I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the guitar for free, but I get to do the gig. And he went, okay, great. This is, this is Ireland, Ireland's a small place, small town. So I, got, I drove straight in and met Lamal and met the other guys. And um, you have that great moment where, again, you're strapped up. And he turned around and said to me, um, Would you, does anybody know the backing vocals? Because this is how little thought had gone into it. Like, they got them on to do something, but then will you do a song? And, and I went, oh, my God, my whole life I've been waiting to go. To, sha, sha, hush, hush. I know. <laughs> I, and then what was brilliant was the cool guitar player, who was Mr. Cool, great player, goes, uh, I, I know them. I like them. And everyone's going, yeah, yeah, we'll all do them. So now you've got, you know, he's going, you're too shy. And everyone's going, hush, hush. I know. I, too. <laughs> it's a so, great yeah. thing, like it. I played, it. The key, I played the guitar. I played it with pride. And Good. You know, shout out, I'm glad to see they're coming back. Shout out to all they the guitar are. players. They are indeed. They are indeed, Jim. And speaking of Lamar and a never ending story, it must feel like with your amazingly diverse career that it's been a never ending story and, and may it continue not to end because you've obviously got a huge career still ahead of you. I can't thank you enough for taking the last 90 minutes to talk to us. It's been an absolute pleasure and um, I'm really excited for everyone to hear um, your amazing career and long may it continue. Oh, guys, it's been a pleasure. You know, it, as I said, see, I'm still waiting for someone to say, you got to stop this and go and do a proper job. Uh, and I've, <laughs> I've been waiting for that since the audition when I was 16. You know, I've been waiting for that and I can't believe that you know it's 36 years later since 86 so since yeah. 24 and you're only halfway jim you're only halfway listen if i can continue to do it i i just want to play music i want to i want to learn as much as i can and that's what i say to you I, i've kind of i did the road for the first 10 years came off it went into tv for like we were nearly 20 years doing television shows you know, and, and you're playing. I was lucky. I played with great guys. The, there was a core five piece there. I did a lot of the work with. Um, and COVID came along and, you know, I, I kind of had a rethink. And I went into doing the, the American show, which was great. It came along at the right time and, you know, did, did a couple of years of that. And at, at the minute now, I'm, I'm, I've got the goo, as we say in Ireland. I've got a kind of goo on me for getting back to writing, composing, working on original material. I've always been kind of commercially minded to say I need to get paid to to keep the life. But that always supplemented doing side projects, development projects, you know, which is where you find that bit of gold. That, that's where you, you know, like the Air Band, I think, was the first one to play with Hosier before yeah. Hosier launched mm -hmm. because... He came in to, we were doing, it wasn't a broadcast show. It was a, we were in the studio, studio all right, but it was right. being done for some group and sound. And no one had heard of him. We hadn't heard of him. I got the, I got the track to learn, you know, we're going to play. And I heard the track at home and went, holy shit, this is amazing. Yeah. And then you meet Andrew and you meet the guy and he's incredible. And you're going, this guy is going, I hope if there is any justice to this world, this guy, and he's the most humble, nicest guy, needs to be a superstar. And he, he, when they become, like, he becomes a superstar. That, for me, is just a great moment. That's a great, he's, like, yeah. it's great to see you can still do it. Singers out there, you just got to do it. And even better, when they come back as 
conquering heroes to do the late late show thing when they're the same person that's where you go they're going to be around for years you know it's there's a few who've come in humble gone away come back right. nightmares but <laughs> you know they're few and far between they're few and far between so for me if i can just keep playing keep learning as i said I plan to do a bit more composition, a bit more trying to learn about orchestration beyond, I think this sounds good. I think strings Absolutely. should do this, you know? Um, that's, that's the plan, guys. And there we have it. As I said, Paul, at the start of the show, Jim had a lot of interesting insights and um, diversity is the word with his career. Just amazing. Oh, very diverse. And do you know what really struck me throughout the interview was at several points, in his career, the first and most notable one being right at the start when he couldn't even really play keyboard, but he joined a band. He was happy to go, you know what, I'll just give this a go and then I'll worry about it afterwards. And, I'll, and, and when I say I'll worry about it afterwards, it wasn't like he didn't do anything. He worked and worked and worked to get to the level he needed to get to to be successful. And there was stories about that with him, uh, with his TV work, with his film composition work, and as I said, right at the start when he auditioned. And I think that's a... A really admirable attitude you know give things a go try something outside of your comfort zone but then do the work to make sure you are competent that's right yeah well put no couldn't agree more so huge thanks to jim for for the generosity of his time and um yeah it was really lovely speaking with him was he, so was he uh, our first, yeah first irish guest david is it the first time we've had an irish guest it may be the case actually yeah we've had a I couple think... of scottish guests on but yeah yeah um, lo love the Irish, and I'm very sad to say I've never been to Ireland. I've been to all the other parts of the UK, but I haven't been to Ireland or Northern Ireland either. Well, so must, like must like a lot of Australians, I'm I'm always proud to tell people that I have Irish heritage. So uh, although my uh, I'm a fifth generation Australian on my my mother's side, but uh, prior to that, it was it was from Ireland. And I've never been there either, but uh, yeah, we still you know I've still got some kinship with the Irish, I think. Yes, we must remedy that. Yeah, no, great stuff. So a huge th uh, thanks to all of you for listening and also to our gold and silver supporters. Tammy Catcher from Tammy's Musical Studio. Thank you as always, Tammy. Hugely appreciated. Um, Dave and the team at the musicplayer.com forums, still going strong after 25 years pretty much, uh, which is brilliant. Um, and then to Mike at midnightmastering.com if you have your own creations and want a really top-notch top notch job done <laughs> on the mixing and mastering. You can tell it's approaching midnight. And um, last but definitely not least, brother Paul Brown from the Water Boys and also the Brothers Brown, which is doing great guns as the, uh, their latest release, Amazing Songs. It's certainly on high rotation on my playlist. So thank you to all those. Thank you to all out there for listening. Thank you to you, Mr. Bindig, and um, we'll be both back relatively soon.